Definitely. Hey everybody, welcome to episode, uh, Matt, what episode number is this? I forgot, seven, six? Uh, seven, I think. Seven. Lucky <laughs> seven. Number seven. Lucky seven. And welcome to uh, Jeff Rothpan and uh, Matt McNeil. Hey. Guys, so this is uh, episode seven, and uh, we're going to be talking to Russell Peters. So, um, this is really interesting to me. I, I did this interview with him, and I've uh, been fascinated with some of these people that I've interviewed because their 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 careers are huge, and they uh, have a huge presence in the comedy world, but... It's not, I talked about this with Russell. It's not like it used to be where you could be, when you're incredibly famous in whatever part of show business, everybody knows who you are. But uh, right. this is not the case with some of the guys I've interviewed. They're, they're famous in their own, own giant groups. Yeah. I think yeah. maybe it's, it's like, you know, back in the day, there were like, five guys because there were only three channels <laughs> you know what i mean yeah well like, it started yeah. as i as i pointed out with russell it started out with the, you know the networks it was three radio networks which turned into television and if you became a star uh on radio back in the 30s and 40s you were known not just in the you know it, it was a little more difficult yep. throughout the world now it's easier to get famous throughout the world but everybody everybody you know when it was three television networks everybody talked about the same thing the next morning at the at the water cooler yeah yeah, we all watched the same thing pretty much back then. So if somebody had no choice, <laughs> night show, like a comedian went on the Tonight Show and became a star after one appearance, it's because millions and millions saw that one shot. And then, uh, but now it's so splintered uh, with so many channels and and uh, you know networks and Netflix and everything else. You you just get your own audience, I guess, but you're not a household name like you used to be. Right. Um, but and now it's on the it's on the world scale because you yeah. can become internationally famous and yeah. still a good portion of the country has no idea who you are. That's why, you know, I, I always take my fame with a grain of salt because, you know, people around me, oh, everybody knows who you are. I go, no, they don't. <laughs> <laughs> the fans know who I am, but there's a bunch of people who go, right. who? <laughs> you know, Little figure. I mean, you know. I got that problem. I, I <laughs> so, Rothman can't even go to the mall. So funny. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what's so funny, guys. No, yeah, no. His own family. Anyway. In his own family, they go who? Right, right. But, but now I knew Russell. By the way, I knew Russell back in Canada, where I'm from. By the way, I'm American now. Congratulations! Oh, that's right. That's great. Congratulations! Yeah, yeah that that that, that, that was a big deal. Uh, it was like a year ago, though, wasn't it? Or two year, year and a half. That I became a citizen? Yeah. 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 It was like, uh, oh, now it's been, you know, because of the pandemic, I'm all screwed up with my time, but I think it's been two years. Right. So, yeah. But, uh, but what you're about to say, sorry. but I want to qualify what I said by saying that that Russell is, I mean, known the world over in, in countries that a lot of us have never been to, uh, much less performed in. Uh, and he yeah. sells out stadiums all over the world. The world. Oh, man. Huge, huge, and I, when I knew him in Canada, what I, what I was going to say was that we used to we used to just play comedy clubs together, and you know he was really funny. So I just thought, wow, he's going to be a great club comic. And it wasn't like so many years later, all of a sudden, I see him playing these huge, like just huge places that you were playing around the world, and I and I, I couldn't figure out what happened. But I guess we find out in the interview. Oh, well, sure, and it and it's kind of simple math. It's the same thing, you know. One video caught on. One of his comedy specials caught on, and uh, a couple of clips went viral, and boom, there he went. Man, that's yeah. great. All right, well, I enjoyed so, work with him way back then. Yeah, have have either of you guys ever seen him uh, in in a large venue live? Oh, not in person, but I did see his specials, like where he was in like a big. I think it was like in England at the O2 Arena or something. And sure. Yeah, and he was just talking like he was back in the clubs. Yeah, and he's he's set all kinds of world records, and uh, yeah, it's it's Man. it's really fun, and uh, he's a funny guy. And uh, for those who aren't familiar, uh, Indian, but grew up in uh, Canada, so he's of uh, Indian descent, and uh, uh, I, I, you know, and he can make fun of stuff. Um, he has license, and he just yeah. goes after it, and it's great. And, and he still goes after it, which is also, I think, really interesting. 
uh, sure. point of view for him. And you'll hear yep. in, you'll hear in the interview that he's a real proponent for sticking with who you are and doing what you do, because otherwise, if you don't, if you you know bow down to all this pressure, then your core audience is going to go away because what you do is why they're there. And if you start not doing that, mm -hmm. then they will go away because you're not making them, you're, you're not on that edge anymore. Yeah. You know, it's really interesting over the last few weeks with uh, the uh, the podcast that you've done. It seems among comedians, there is there is this sort of like the, the, the same sentiment that you're just saying is like, you know, uh, everybody feels a little bit boxed in. But at the same time, you still got to do your thing. Yeah. And, and I pointed that out um, yeah. with Adam Carolla that well, what, what do you mean being canceled? He won't be canceled because he has his own show and his own network. He can say whatever he wants and do whatever he wants. And it's it's kind of the same thing on the road. Again, as Russell points out, it's like, so what? If you're offending those people, they're not going to come to your show anyway. Who cares? That's true. Right. Just do what you do. Do what you do. And you're 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 appealing to a, a giant piece of the population and they love it. And you, you, of course, there's a line. There are lines that you don't want to go over, certain subjects you don't want to talk about, certain things you don't want to say. But the difference is that line for the woke crowd is certainly not the same place where the line is for your audience. Or a stand-up right. comedian, because it's your job to really test those boundaries and figure out where you can go with it. Otherwise, you know, where's where's the funny? Sure. Right. Right. Everybody's the same after that if, you, if we all stick to the same. Yeah. Same rules. Yeah. And I, I don't I don't want to bring myself up again, but you know, when I came out with Ahmed the Dead Terrorist, uh people thought I was absolutely mentally ill. And <laughs> I remember that. And now he has his own t shirt. <laughs> yeah. Oh nice. <laughs> Nicely done. <laughs> yeah, I remember those days. I remember yeah. when I would open for you that uh, somebody came up to me and said, you know, uh, when you had Ahmed, one of the first times you had ever had Ahmed on stage and uh they they said to me, they said, What 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 is he doing? <laughs> what is he doing? Well, That's there there's a very well known club owner that we all know who yeah. asked me, he said, We're getting so many complaints. Uh and it was in a, a, a very uh non conservative part of the country and uh uh you know a little bit left and he said we, we, he claimed claimed and we all know this person maybe he exaggerated a bit uh said yeah. we're getting a bunch of complaints you, you got to stop doing Ahmed and this was between shows on like a Friday night and I said uh, oh uh, all right I understand all right and I went back to you know backstage and I'm sitting there by myself and I'm going no I am not going to stop doing Ahmed because I have been using him all over the country and people love this. And I'm not, you know, it, it's like, I'm not saying horrible. I'm not talking about anybody's religion. I'm talking about terrorists for God's sakes. Yeah. So um, I, I, I said, screw it. And I walked on stage and that next show and did it anyway. <laughs> Cut to the international version of that, which was in the all over the mat special yeah. where Ahmed was banned in Malaysia. Right. When I, yeah. when I say this, he literally was banned in Malaysia. Yeah. yeah. I don't mean to put that in air quotes, but yeah. um, but he was banned in Malaysia, and you said no. Nope, yeah. This is what people came to see. Yeah. Let's do this. Thing. Yeah, because I, I, you know, people who represent me kept saying you can't do use Ahmed in Malaysia, and I'm like, what? That's why they bought the tickets. That's why we're That's there. True. So yeah. I, you know, I, but there, you know, Malaysia, you could be arrested on stage, taken away, caned. There was the guy that was caned, wasn't it? There in Malaysia, caned for oh, spray yeah. painting for right. tagging. They cane you for gum out. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. So I, I thought, all right, I'm going to do this, but I, I'm going to try and get away with something, so I have a good chance of not being arrested and hauled away. Yeah. <laughs> and so, the folks who know the story, I changed him, and I couldn't even say the name Ahmed on stage. Couldn't even say the but name. You did. Do you but remember? You did. I actually. I accidentally did. I, did. I, yeah. I know the look on your face in that video. Because I like, didn't know what I'd said. Because we changed the them. audience went, ooh. But hold on, but hold on a second. You're getting to the end of the yeah. story first. I was in there going, ooh. Yeah, because what I did was I changed Ahmed the dead terrorist to his French cousin, uh, Jacques Merde. Oh, Jacques Merde. <laughs> <laughs> and um, w w <laughs> which means jack shit in right. French. Right. But he now was Jacques Merde, the French terrorist. <laughs> and uh, he came out. I put a chapeau on his head, a little beret, and I put a mustache on him, and he had a French accent. And we did the entire act exactly the same way, but he did it with a French accent. It was the French ter right. terrorist. <laughs> and, and the guards were standing oh. around going, do, do we arrest this guy? Yeah. Oh, what is it? We're, we're not quite sure what we're going to do. But then during the Dear Jacques Merd questions, 
I I said it, where people write out the questions and it's dear Jacques I said well now we're going to do the do Ahmed, dear Ahmed questions and I didn't know what I'd said and the whole audience goes oh <laughs> and I'm I'm looking around. I li- you can see me look down. I literally thought my pants had popped off, and that's what it sounded like. It's like, oh. <laughs> and um, I I I look down like this. I'm like, what's going on? And then I realized what I'd said, and it was like, because <laughs> you know, in the comment section to that YouTube video, I, I I always read, did that really happen? Was that you know, did you do that on purpose? And the answer was. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> I'm not stupid. No. I mean, Audrey, you know, my wife was right over there off stage, and I didn't want to be hauled away. Say, see you later. So <laughs> that was that was that. Anyway, but be able to sit there, down right? for a week, <laughs> <laughs> or I'd still be in jail there. We're not going home, I guess. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, anyway, uh, back to Russell. The the interview was great, and uh, what a good guy. Um, uh, and, and there's also something we reveal in the interview that may come to fruition. And Matt, there's oh. actually been a, uh, uh, I actually had a Zoom call uh, with him and me and the other guy that we talk about in the show after the interview, and everybody thinks it's a great idea. And, oh. you know, it's all in the planning stages right now, and it'd probably be a oh. year, year and a half away. But it, it's kind of fun what we talked about and the potential mm. and how everybody wants to do this. So you'll see. Oh, okay. All right. Suspense. Here we go. <laughs> My guest today sells out stand-up concerts all over the world. He's been on the Forbes list. He became the first comedian to get a Netflix stand-up special. I call him a friend, but we've never done lunch. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Russell Peters. Russell, how are you? Hey, good. I'm an L.A. friend. That's how you get that's, that's what an L.A. friend is. <laughs> that's right. We, we no, Nobody ever does anything. I, I, anything, ever. You, you did drive out to my house one time, which I thought was nice. Well, yeah. In all honesty, though, I think I, it was by accident, but still. Yeah, I, I, uh, I actually drove up into your driveway because I was yeah. turning around, having driven by Howie's house. <laughs> right, 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 exactly. And then I was like, "Hey, Jeff," and you're like, "Russ." Yeah, we, we like, had no, we had no idea you lived there. And honestly, it's a joke okay. that I have with Howie now that I'll drive by his house and honk or wave, and you know he'll never come out, especially now, ever. And and well, so and also. Yeah. His driveway's so long, you're never gonna. He's never gonna hear the honk. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's true. But I, I told this last time when I interviewed him. His we did this last time, and I texted him. I said, "We're driving by. Open your window and say hi." And we drove by, and Audrey goes, "My wife goes, look, his window's open. Do you think he's gonna say hi?" I go, "No, it's a total accident." So what we did that one time is we we drove up, and and I was turning around because we didn't want to go the long way. And I said, I'll just pull in this driveway. She goes, no, don't go in there. I go, no, it's fine. I don't know who this is. So we pulled in right as you walked out the front door. Hilarious. <laughs> yeah, and I'm like, Russell, you live here? Wow, nice. I was most impressed with, though, uh, the, 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 the fort or the kids play structure thing. Did you put that in? Oh, yeah, yeah the, uh, the little play area. The, yeah. Like the little... Uh... Wouldn't you? Yeah, yeah, I put that in. It wasn't little. It was two stories. It's like, but wait, did you do it yourself? Did you build it? No, hell no, I didn't do it myself. <laughs> you no, don't, no, no. Let's you don't not know. get crazy, Jeff. <laughs> okay. Well, you know, that's... I could see you. I could see you doing that because you're good, like with working and building things. You build your your figures all day. I yeah, mean, the dummies. Yeah, <laughs> you know, but... yeah. I, and you're right. Yeah. I did. I did build the one. It was a. It was a kit. It just you know you order the kit and it's just all it shows up is a pile of wood that's been cut. And you have to figure yes. out which pieces go where. So you hired guys to do that. And they probably did it in like Oh, a, hell yeah. Yeah, okay. Anyway. No, there's no way I'm ever going to figure that out. <laughs> so listen. I, Look, th- th- it's a cross. <laughs> but, dad, but dad, you're an atheist. doesn't matter. It's a cross. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. We nailed it together. So listen, this this part confused me here. So it, it, it said you were the first comic um, uh, to get a Netflix stand-up special. Is that is that right? I'm the guy. What would I'm you the get? Guy that started it all. So you got Amy Schumer money? No, I didn't. That's what. That's I think maybe that's why we don't work together. Now. Yeah. So <laughs> you know, because I I was I think I got one of the first ones. I think because right after I made my deal is when they made the deal with the other guys that got crazy ass money. Oh, that. So then you did it in 2015, six, six, 2015 or sixteen. You did it. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And then because we made the, we made the two special deal and they locked in the price of the second one. And literally a month after that, they made those giant yes. ones 
with the, twenty million a pick, twenty million a special they were giving out after that was the going rate right for anybody but us. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, oh well, here we I are. I was to that. They approached me in two thousand twelve to do it. Is that right? And I was so small minded, thinking it's two. You got to figure it's nine years ago. They're like, uh, we want to do your next special. I'm like, sure, great. Huh? Uh, um, you want to buy it off me? They're like, no, no, we're gonna, we're gonna. But we're going to pay for it all and produce it and you're going to you know do everything and then we're going to own it i go okay and can i so i could still but i can still make the dvd right and they're like what and they go because i'm i'm thinking dvd still yeah sure but you know what i'm like what, yeah but what about this dvd part they're like no there's no dvd part we own it it's ours i go but how do i make money off of it and they're like we're going to give you this money and then that's it i go yeah, but what about the DVDs? Like you're missing a good chunk of money here. On yeah, DVDs. and you know, so I did my two specials with them, with them, and that's why I went back to Comedy Central. So I've done one with them, did it during the pandemic, but back back in September, October, and I got two more uh, coming up. So uh, and and I like that because we can make the DVD, and that's what's sad. I got a shelf back here with my right. nine of my ten specials, and there's nine right. DVDs, and there's one missing. What? Or there's two missing. I'm sorry, it's eight out of the ten. Yeah, it's right. the Netflix ones. I don't have a DVD, so no. yeah, I, I it, it's it, it was it was good. I mean, it was cool to be the first guy doing it because, I, but at the time, nobody knew what I was doing. Like everyone was like, "What are you doing?" I go, "It's going to be on Netflix," and they go, "What's Netflix?" And I go, "They're like, uh, they're going to mail it out to people." Everyone kept thinking they were still mailing it out to people. <laughs> oh, that's I forgot about that. That's right. You have to yeah. send stuff back. Oh my gosh, yeah. I forgot you had to send the disc back they it was all a yeah they send it to you you watch it for as long as you want then you gotta mail it back uh, yeah that seems so long ago doesn't it it does and it really wasn't that long ago wow all right so the, the first question i know everybody asks everybody what so no, no first i want to say this so people who are watching right now the majority of them or listening the majority of them probably know who you are and are fans but there are a handful of people who are just my fans and listening just because it's me so well wait I, I do find that the most common thread between when people say, we're your favorite comics, they usually lump you, me, and Gabriel together all the time. Whenever I see who's your favorite, they'll be like, Fluffy, Jeff Dunham, and Russell Peters. It's For some reason, the three of us go together. I, I, then we should do some sort of special. Oh, my God. We should do a tour. That would be <laughs> insane. Well, I talked about Gabe uh, about this, and uh, I, I it would be nuts. But do you... Would do the audiences cross over? Because this is what I was going to with this next thing, is that uh, it's so interesting how in show business now, in stand up, in in comedy, you can become a star, a huge star, the world over, and not be a household name at all. And yeah, uh, yeah, and it's it's just nuts because it's it's so spread out. But it is amazing now compared to you know, let's say the radio days or whatever when comedians were huge, like Bob Hope, how you can be an international star uh, now so much easier than you could back then. I, I don't know my point, but my point is there's there's kind of room for everybody, but it's also a little bit frustrating. It is because they they marginalize you when you do it without them the machine of the giant networks or studios, when you get famous or popular or whatever it is we become without the studio, they kind of go, all right, well, we're going to stop that part from you forever happening because you did it without us. And it's kind of like, all right, well, I'm still going to be rich, but okay. Yeah, but I mean, it's that point. At you're, that point, they're just playing on your ego. And if your ego is in check, then you'll be fine. But to counter that, you've been doing a lot of TV and you've been doing a, a you had your show uh, uh, with the detective show, right? What was it called? Uh -huh. Sorry. Oh, yeah. The Indian detective. The Indian detective. Yeah. So you've you've had some great acting roles. So that that counters what you're saying, because you've you've now. No, it doesn't. You no. know why? Because those were all independent and then we sold it to them. Oh, so, so everything that I've ever done has been self um, propelled, you know, like with this was brought that Indian detective was brought to me from like a, these investors. And then this other guy it was all came together with like, hey, we want to do this show, want to build it around you. And and none of these are studios. And then we eventually got the package together. We're like, 
here, we got the money, we got this, we got that. You guys want to be involved? And I'm like, yeah, we'll buy it once you do it. And then, so that, that's how that came together. But then the crazy part is like for your specials, and again, I know this is why Netflix loves you, is because you bring in audiences from the all over the globe. Unlike, you know, Joe Schmo here in the States who, who do, or in Canada who does a special or two and gets huge numbers only in the U.S., but Netflix is worldwide. So they love the international, uh, the comics with the international appeal because you do those huge numbers, right? Well, I think that's that was what the thinking was. But then they started branching out which is good i mean they started branching out to other comics in other countries which is also a pretty smart move because you know it's uh, if listen if you're in a, if you're in the middle east and they keep showing you north americans that are doing their impression of what it's like to be middle eastern or indian or or asian or whatever and they're going to be like yeah we have our own guy here how come we're not seeing him so they started putting the guys on from different regions and then they started adding them to their um count they still got us so the good thing for us is that we got expanded, but their local guys got some screen time, but their local guys never got to us. Well, it, but that's the appeal of you, though. It's not just uh, – I, I don't think there's a bigger audience than the Indian audience, right? I mean, it's – Have you been yet? No, I haven't. I've been asked a couple of times, and we and I, yeah. I think the pandemic got in the way. <laughs> it's, you know, it's, it's little speed you know, bumps like that. You better like get that. out there before Terry Fader goes, uh, is all I'm I, saying. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> I'm duly noted. Um, uh, <laughs> maybe I could open for you there. That would <laughs> that would be fun. Uh, listen, I'm telling you, if you, me, and Gabe did a show in India, we would do like 100,000 people. Then then why don't we do it? I, 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 think I don't know. <laughs> talk to each other. Let's talk to each other. I'm open to it. I'm, I would host it. I think, oh, man, that'd be so much fun. And I, it, it's just... It, and what an article, it, it, what a write-up. It, it's like, how do you figure this? You can't. It just, you cannot. Somebody puts that to paper. And then that would be a special all by itself. Oh, hell yeah. Yeah. So. Um, I, 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 I'm all for it. Okay, let me ask you this. And this is the other obvious uh, question. Um, it, with the cancel culture and all that, and that's pretty much what your new um, podcast is about. And I'll give you the plug here, though. It's on iHeart uh, and uh, Cloud 10 Media Podcast. It's called Culturally yep. Canceled. And um, does that pretty much explain... You're, you're literally in your backyard talking to folks. Is that correct? I'm in my backyard having a cigar, having a drink. And it's conversations like, <clears throat> you know, conversations we would have if there was no cameras or recording equipment on. Right. And 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 but we're recording it. And if there's something, let's just say, you know, you said something and you're like, shit, you know what? Can I don't want people. I'll take it out. I'm right. not going to. Right. I'm not trying to aha or bait anybody. So but for the for the most part, we've had nobody tell us, hey, can you take that out? Because it's literally just candid conversations that. Even my friends that know me um, were like, oh, my God, this is great because people ask me, what's it like to hang out with Russell? And I go, go listen to this. It's exactly like that. And and do so, you do you loosen them up like Rogan does by, you know, the, the drinks are free flowing, correct? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> it's so funny for and, me to, to, to watch a podcast like that and watch them, you know, towards the end, it comes completely different than how it began. Oh, man, I remember when, last time I did Rogan's podcast was July of last year, and I got hammered. <laughs> <laughs> I, I remember by the end, I was like, ah, rah, rah, rah. Um, there's all, you know, there's a there's a podcast called Drink Champs. It's right? uh, it's in Miami. It's a friend of mine. Uh, he's a rapper named Nori, Noriega. Yep. Um, no, it's and, not. Really? That's the greatest yeah, name. His name's, he, co he goes by Nori, but it's short for Noriega because he used to be in a group called Capone and Noriega. Anyway, so. <laughs> Perfect. And uh, and his is like every time they like ring a bell or something, you got to do this shot. So a friend of mine who's also a rapper said, and he's kind of like a gangster guy. Right. And he's like, yo, Russ, I'll do it. But I need you to do it with me because I don't drink like that. And I'm like, all right, cool. Let's do it. So my buddy came with me. He's like this. Nori was excited to see that guy because he's like a legendary rapper, too. And right. So every time they gave my friend Bumpy a shot, I said, don't worry about it, Bump. And I took his shot for him. <laughs> so I started doing double the shots. And I don't smoke weed, but Nori smokes these insane blunts like this big. Right. And he lights one up and he's like, you want some of this? And I'm drunk. I go, give me that. <laughs> and I hit this thing like, I hit it like I smoke. I don't smoke. I'm like, <laughs> 
And then, and then he light, maybe about 10 minutes later, he lights up another one. He goes, you want to go, give me that again. Like, this one's stronger. I go, whatever. And I'm like, and I hit it. And literally two minutes later, he's talking to Bumpy. And all you see is this. <laughs> and he's like, Perfect. we'll ask Russell when he wakes up. And I'm like, huh, but, but yeah, yeah, yeah. That's great. Makes for great TV, right? <laughs> yeah. And as soon as I went outside, the air hit me and I puked. Oh, no. Oh, well, that's <laughs> a lovely ending to the story. It's perfect. It was a great night. Yeah. So, look, uh, it, when you when you watch your specials, it, you know, you do a lot of crowd work, which is fantastic. That's some of my favorite things to do is just messing with folks. Is that is that is that is that a favorite part for you? Just messing with that, people? That, that is my favorite part, actually, because you don't know where it's going to go. You don't know what's going to happen. Right. You don't know what they're going to say. And, and, and I uh, noticed that was one of one of your first clips on your channel is is that when you're just messing with dudes in the front row. It had to be because you said, yeah, that's one of my favorite things. We got to put that there. Is that it? Yeah, basically. I was like, yeah, let's just do it. Let's put I, all the clips they put out now are just crowd work because I'm not going to give away material for free. <laughs> <laughs> OK, <laughs> right. And, you know, you, you can at least laugh. And But it's funny. I'd be like. Same old jokes. I'm like, how's it the same joke, asshole? I didn't fucking say this before. Right. The same old jokes. You right. need to write more, bro. Seriously, with the I'm like, get out of here. get off my. But see, that's why it works so great for the crowd too, and is because they know it's brand new, it's fresh, and they could never have seen this before. I've done that a couple of times when I actually walked out in the crowd with a dummy because there was somebody I was talking to. I wanted to get closer to him, and you know, the, the, my, one of my favorite ones we're in a big arena. You know, how many thousands of people? And and this this woman, this girl. It's, I think it's a woman. It is a woman. It's a female. And I'm talking to her from the stage with a dummy. I can't see it real well. See her real well. So I walk out there with with Peanut, and I'm talking to her, and Peanut kind of starts starts hitting on her and then i realize she's really young so now oh, it's gotten oh. kind of awkward and, <laughs> and the audience knows it's gotten awkward and then peanut has to back off a little bit and then he says so who are you here with and she points down the road she goes my dad <laughs> right and then it's right. so it's you know the laughs are huge and it's even more awkward and then he says well what, what does he do for a living and of course he's a cop and you know you can't right. you can't write that stuff. Exactly. Mm -hmm. You don't know where it's going to go, and then it's just like, wow, this. It's like the comedy gods go, "Here's a good one for you. <laughs> Take this one, Jeff." Yeah, and then and of course, uh, people then accuse you of having shills. That that was that they'll come to you afterwards and go, "Yeah, that was a that's, complete that's setup." The thing that drives me the most insane. Do you plant the audience? I go, I'm not that good of an actor. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and, and that's kind of an insult because it's like, wait, you think that I'm not funny enough to have done that on my own. Yeah. Right. It's not, frustrating. It's not nice. But so um, being Indian and having grown up in Canada, you mm -hmm. uh, and not being what I am, an older white guy in this day and age. You're not, I don't think you're that much older than me, though, are you? Okay, we're both older guys. I just mean older, as in we're not young anymore. No, I think I'm two. Yeah. Year, I think I'm two years older than you. So you're 57 yeah. now, right? I'm yeah, right. <laughs> I'm 51. <laughs> Wait, where Son did I read this. somewhere? Oh no, I know what it was. I apologize. What it was, you know how I learned the most about you the the quickest was watching the animated, um, the animated opening to your special where it basically did your whole life in a cartoon. Right. So my where it, brother's fifty-seven. That's right. That's where it said in my head because the date it shows when he was born, and it, it was before 64. they put his name on there, and that date clicked in my head, and I go, "Wow, Russell and I are only two years apart." So that, I apologize. So oh, you look great was. then, huh? <laughs> <laughs> you look great. <laughs> you look great for almost sixty. Yay! I'm sixty in you two know, weeks. You really do. I mean. <laughs> White people generally age horribly. You look fantastic. <laughs> Thanks. I don't know. You know. You know. My wife is. Uh, you're. You're not like vegetarian or vegan, are you? No. Oh, I didn't think so. Yeah. My my, my wife did that to us a couple of years ago, and so uh, I'll still eat the meat now and then just because I want to and I love it. But ninety five percent of the time, and I honestly think that's had a lot to do with me not looking horrible as of yet. I don't know. I it does. It I, it really does put the brakes on the whole aging thing. Really. I, yeah, I guess I, you know what's funny is it, you'll get to that point now where you have friends that are your age and you look like you're in pretty good shape and are doing well. But you'll have mm -hmm. friends from like high school, people who have stayed in a small town and they just have given up. Oh, and, are and you they, kidding? I'm in, I'm, I'm in Toronto right now. Right. And I, and I've I, my friends, I'm just like, dude, what? How are you still doing the exact same thing we were doing when we were 14? <laughs> 
<laughs> and like literally, I'm like, what are you doing? Like your time management is horrible. Your ability to comprehend things outside of this local little circle is is imp- it's, it's it's frustrating. Well, there's that, but the law, there's also the point where they will get they think they're old. And they will start acting old and they will start looking old and you'll be going, what, what am I doing different? Why do I, you know what I mean? Have, has it gotten to that point at all yet? Um, well, most of them are black, so they don't actually look that old. <laughs> <laughs> I know that's, yeah. you know what? I used to compliment, I used to compliment, uh, like a, if I'd meet a black woman, I would say, oh my gosh, it's not fair. I go, you guys just don't age and you mm-hmm. can't, I can't say that now you sure can uh, listen I'm, I'm one of those believers in intent and people really need to focus on the intent behind the words not not the words because when your intention is that you were your intention is to be complimentary then that's how it should be that's how it should be read it shouldn't be read any other way but then i talk about it in my new act i'm talking about like you know the difference between tone and intent and i said if you were to hand me a transcript of everything I said tonight and didn't tell me it was me, I would cancel myself. Well, that's what I'm saying. If you close your eyes and listen to your act and you you don't have an accent except for the accent well, that yeah. we're all familiar with. Um, right, I was born in Canada, so you kind of don't get that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. And then that is funny, you know, whatever. You, I, I joke about that whenever I'm in another country with a dummy. The, the dummy says, that, well, their accent. I go, they don't have an accent. We have an accent. It's, so anyway. But um, my my point is, if you close, if if an American or a Canadian would close their eyes, you sound like a white dude making fun of other races, right? Hilarious. Just the same <laughs> way that you say, if you just saw it written, you'd be canceled. So it's so crazy to me. The but I I get it, I understand it. The seeming license that anybody other than somebody like m- me tends to have because you get away with so much but get away but it's all it's all legit it's 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 all funny stuff and everybody in the place is laughing has there been any blowback have you had to pull back at all in the last few years no and and i'll tell you why you won't neither you won't either have to do that either because the people that are coming to see you are coming to see that and the people that have a problem with what you're doing we're never going to come and see you right and we're never going so they People that have a problem with that kind of stuff just are not going to contact you. They're not going to come to your shows. They already know what you do. And if they have a problem with it, then they're just, it's some sort of witch hunt for you at that point. But but, but then it becomes frustrating online because everybody has a voice now. And you will, oh, you, you, that's you, irritating. You will, yeah, you will be trashed to no end as being this horrible, horrible person. It's like, have yeah. you been to my show? Have you, yeah. instead of taking these, these two lines out of context, do you know what came before and after and what else I talked about and picked on? Do, do you not understand? Yeah. This is like, okay, I've never thought of this before. This is like tasting a spoonful of salt and going, well, that cake is horrible. Yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah you, you, put, you put the salt and the sugar beside each other. <laughs> yeah. You, you mix the stuff together and then it's a whole thing. You can't just taste the salt and think that the cake yeah. is horrible. I'm going to keep yeah, that analogy. Egg is raw because it's not been mixed. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Okay. So then now I'm curious about the, and uh, forgive me if this is a little bit trite, but I now I'm curious about the Apu thing because the Apu thing, it, it's like, you know, I mean, where do you stand on this? Because you are Indian, you, 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 you poke fun at your own uh, heritage. Uh, so wh- wh- where do you stand on this whole thing? I'm actually in the documentary, the Apu documentary. Oh, you are? Well, I need to watch it. I've just heard about the it. The problem, is it called The Problem with Apu? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um. So here's the thing. Growing up, we had nobody to look at on TV. Right. We, uh, like when I started doing stand up, I started in 89 and there was nobody. I was the first Indian guy. Right. And so growing up, uh, if I thought if I really wanted to feel like I connected with somebody on TV and I'm not making this up, I, I connected with Eric Estrada because he looked Indian as hell. <laughs> okay. And in Canada, we didn't have Mexican people. So I'm like, wow, look at this, look at this Indian guy on chips. And then Paul Rodriguez on on Hey Pablo. And I was like, oh man, we're doing it. We're really and they're like, I'm like, well, I was like Mom, what's a Mexican? Oh no. That's funny. <laughs> what part of India is Mexicans from? <laughs> That's really funny. And uh, yeah, so uh, we had, you know, we just had that to look at. 
And then it wasn't until I was a little older and I realized, oh, my God. And then Apu came on on The Simpsons. And I was like, uh, we'll take him, I guess. I mean, we got nothing else. <laughs> well, I, you know, I did see, I did watch a couple of clips and it was, I don't think you were in the group. There was a group of, uh, were they all comics or all actors in comics, people in show business? And they said, I guess the question was asked, does Apu offend you? And everybody raised their hand, yes. Yeah, I mean, that's a younger generation. I can't remember what I said in that. Mm -hmm. But I must have said something similar to what I just said now because yeah. we really didn't have anybody. It was like, yeah, it was offensive because the only, only reason it was offensive was more because people would use it against you. You know, people would call you Apu or people would call you, uh, what was uh, Johnny Quest Haji? They would call you that. That was you the know. question they asked. Have you, have, have you all been called Apu? And they all went, yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, if that's the hardest part of your life, get the fuck over it already. You know what I mean? It's just like, grow up. I got bullied. Like, I got real racism I dealt with growing up. So I, I, Apu was the least of my worries. You know, when, when I'm four or five years old and I'm a four, a cute little four or five year old boy and a grown white man sprays me with a hose and spits on me or, or calls me names or when I go to the park, I get kicked or punched for no reason. That's the problem. That's what right. was happening to me. So Apu was like, oh, whatever. It's a cartoon. It's not real. That's what you was know? happening to you. Is that right? Yeah, in the 70s. And in, in Canada in the 70s was not so nice to Indian people. We were, we were very... It was very, it was very un, 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 uh, unfavorable to be Indian in Canada at that time. What was there a, a neighborhood, or were you just an outlier? Your family in the house? No, there? there was no, there wasn't a big influx of. Well, there there might have been, but we were spread out. And, and where I where I ended up growing up, we moved to in like 1974, 1975, Brampton. Um, at the time, was just blue collar white people and and working class black people. So. Uh, I hung around the black kids because they never did anything to me. They never bothered me. They never bullied me. So I was like, oh, okay, I'm safe here. And I would see white people and I would generally turn around because I'm like, uh -uh, I don't, I'm not going to get kicked or punched for no reason right now. Mm -hmm. And uh, and now the ironic part is my hometown is like 98% Indian. Yeah, I, I, and that was that's where you did the, that special, right? Oh, I did it in Toronto. Oh, but they, they, the talked about, Toronto. they talked about, talked about how do you pronounce it? Brampton. Brampton. They talked about Brampton being your hometown. So how far is Brampton from Toronto? Is it? Like 20, 20 minutes. Okay, okay. North. Oh. 20 minutes northwest. Right. But, I mean, listen, if, if, I'm, if I'm a real soft piece of work, I'm going to let that affect me to today and be like, white people are evil. This is all bad. But it was a question of this new, these new immigrants came to the country and they didn't know what to do. So they panicked and they, that's how they reached out and they lashed out. Now it's, now there's, you know, you, you can't, you can't live in the past with, oh, this is how they are. It's like, that's just, it's just how they were. And when new immigrants come in, they do it to those immigrants. Now. So it's, it's just kind of like almost human nature, I guess. Right. Well, getting back to the performing part of it, it, it is kind of a conundrum for me because I, you know, I, 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 you can't please everybody all the time. And there is a point where you go, well, just screw it. I'm just going to entertain my crowd and the people that I love. But, uh, exactly. but I, but at the same time, I still like to bring in new fans um, and there are things that I refuse to take out of my act and I will keep them in there just because I've done them or I've had those characters for so long and people love them. And if I took them out, that would almost be worse. Yes. You you, you would be trying to, uh, appeal to people that were never going to be appealed to. Right. And, and I think and you're going to lose your core because that the, the core they're with you because they're like, we know this is our guy. We know what we're going to get. He's not going to offend us because we know him. Right. Yeah. And, and but but on the on the other hand, you do know as a performer that line with your crowd that you want to push to the edge of, and the closer you get to the edge, the harder they're laughing. But then you know there's that point where suddenly uh, now a bunch of them are not laughing because you did go too far. But that's that magic little line you have to go up to, right? Yeah, you got to figure it out, and you know where it is when you're doing it. And some, you know, there'll be some nights where you can't go as far as you did the night before, and then there'll be other nights where you can go past the line. Right. And and is there is there one incident where you can you recall anything where you just went too far and went, oh, that wasn't good, or it actually did get you into trouble? In any any of those really good stories? Um. Well, one, you know, okay. So one night I asked. There was a couple in the audience. <laughs> and I said, you, you know, I'm talking to them. And I'm like, do you, have, do you have any kids? And they go, yeah. 
we had uh, we had three, and I go, well, "What do you mean we had three? Well, oh no! Uh, well, one died, right? And then the ho- it just put a whole funk in the audience, right? Oh and I go, man! And then I go, "Don't try and fuck up my show with your dead kid." Oh no! <laughs> and it worked. Oh, it worked. Oh, it worked <laughs> because it was so extreme oh, to say no. something like that, and they <laughs> even laughed. Oh no, that's and brilliant! I was like, oh my god, thank goodness for that because I was scared to shit. Out that's of my, brilliant, oh, horrible. Man, you're gonna fuck up my whole show. <laughs> I just, I just turned red at that. Yeah. <laughs> and I, you know, and I, you know, doing what I do with the other guy. I see. I love what I do because I can do point and counterpoint. So if something, oh, yeah. hor- or and, something, and, hor- and you can blame it on him. Uh, absolutely. And I'll say it's just part of the, and it is part of the act because I will push it further with the dummy, knowing that I can pull it back and go, wait a second. And so my favorite ad libs are when something like that happens and I act just as astonished at the audience, but you also know how ad libs it. When that came out of your mouth, you know, that came from a part of your brain that you weren't controlling and it just came out of your mouth and there was no getting it back. Right. Yeah. It was, it was literally reactionary. (laughs) It's literally my it's like the guard that is the filter went, hey, I'm going to go to the bathroom. And you're like, oh, the word just came out. <laughs> That's right. It, it, um, I was talking to uh, Adam um, Corolla the other day. And I think what I told him was I think that part of his success is because he doesn't, he doesn't, his inner voice, he's somehow hooked up to his mouth. He oh, just yeah. and he, and he has his own network. He has his own show. He doesn't care if you know if the only pe- people he has to answer to are the advertisers. But if they if they don't like it, they'll go away. And then fine, there's a bunch of them sta- standing in line. So uh, it's just kind of refreshing for me to to hear that, and it's also but, re- refreshing to hear that from you because I but think did, did Adam. Yeah. Did, did Adam let you speak on your show? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, uh, what you you were on it? Oh, okay, okay. He was on my show. He was on yeah, my I know, show. But did he let you speak on it? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, it was a really different tone and a different take because when you're on his show, and I told him that towards the end of the interview, <laughs> that it was like whenever I'm on your show, I don't know why I'm there. <laughs> you know? I did it. I did it two weeks ago, and I was like, "Do you need me here for this?" Yeah. And were, were you sitting there? Were you in studio or on, on Zoom? No, it was on Zoom. And I'm just like, he's talking and I'm kind of like, hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but at least they can you draw let me know in. when you're done. Yeah, at least they can. <laughs> see, it's 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 sneaky because now he draws in your audience. He advertises you're going to be on. But it's still just his show. That's fine. Yeah, That's no, it's, it's supposed to be. We're supposed to counter off each other yeah right it's it's i worked with mickey rooney for uh one year i was in a, a off-broadway show and it's not quite to the point but talking to mickey rooney who was a crazy genius it was uh, talking a uh, carry on a conversation with mickey rooney was like this uh-huh I, yeah i agree yep yeah, absolutely <laughs> that's that's wow. pretty much all you did because he just chatted and chatted all right so again that's really refreshing to hear from you and i do think that they're there has to be some sort of backlash coming. There is. It's you, coming. And you think. And you think we're going to be back to doing what it is that we want to do uh, yep. or that we enjoy doing, and people are going to grow a couple. Let me ask you this. Have you ever physically met one of these outraged people? My answer should be no. But I I did have is when I first moved to Los Angeles and nobody knew who I was. And I was doing that thing, you know, going around to the comedy clubs, doing the guest spots and doing horribly. Because here, you know, you know how it is, especially when you go to the, uh, uh, you know, uh, the improv, the the store, the improv uh, Melrose, uh, uh, Melrose Improv. And, you know, it's like, okay, so and so and so and so and so and so. And now the puppet show. And I get up with a dummy. And it was just, yeah. it was half my fault because I was just intimidated by that room. But I was doing something, some sort of thing. And I had Jose Jalapeno on the stick, right? And mm-hmm. I, I've always tried to make sure that he was just Jose Jalapeno and Peanut and, and he have a thing. And Jose always one ups Peanut somehow. And he's just, you know, he's a jalapeno on a stick. That's it. And Mexican jalapeno. And he's changed nationalities throughout the routine just for the sake of yeah. jokes, right? And so I did have this one woman come after the show. We had to get in a van to go somewhere. She goes, you're horrible. I'm like, what? 
She goes, I, I can't believe you're doing that. That's it's horrible. You should never even be allowed on stage. I'm like, what did I do? And she was just incensed. And, and it was a white woman. And I'm like, yeah, well, I, that's. Yeah. Yeah, that's the problem. It's like it's the people that are getting outraged are never the people that are being spoken about. And that's I, I actually did a joke about it on one of my specials 15 years ago. And I said, people are getting mad on behalf of other people, which is even more frustrating because that means you think that the people that are being spoken about are too dumb to get it themselves and that you have to point it out for them. Maybe they're not offended and it's you who, who has a superiority complex that makes you feel smarter than everybody else that they should be offended. They're like, no, so we're not offended. It's you and you're over hypersensitive. And maybe it's your own demons that are getting uh, bothering you. Maybe it's maybe there's something that it struck a chord with on you and you felt, oh, my God, I've been repressing these feelings for so long. I can't I, I need to fight this more. Well, you know, it's the same thing with Fluffy and Speedy Gonzalez because he plays Speedy uh -huh. Gonzalez in an upcoming. I don't know what it is. And, you know, with Slowpoke and Speedy Gonzalez, they, you know, people are saying how horrible and racist and blah, blah, blah. And so many of the Hispanic folks spoke up and said, leave one of our heroes alone. We love Speedy Gonzalez. Yeah. So to your point, that's it. Right? Yeah, it's it. But I've never. But listen, OK, so you met a person who was offended by one thing that you did one night. Right. But the actual outraged people, the whole cancel culture people, I don't know who they are. No. I've never physically seen them. I think they're fucking bots. Yeah, oh, that's that's funny. That's, that's, yeah, exactly. It's a yeah, we're in a simulation and uh and the 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 kid and the dad that are playing our game are sending those uh, those uh, things out just to to screw yeah. with us and see how we handle it. Yeah. Yeah, they've unlocked a new level. <laughs> well, that's right. Well, you know, I, I've always said this that um uh, things started heading downhill when the when the smartphone came out because you know usually and I, I said this as, as well the other day it's it's very obvious before everybody had a voice if you got mad at somebody you talk about it with your family or your friends and that's it but now you get mad about something it's like everybody has the equal powerful voice by putting it on whatever social media platform and then yeah. it can get picked up. And no matter who you are, you can be Joe Schmuck the idiot and just put the right words together and suddenly you're famous. Oh, yeah. It's it's very, uh, yeah, it's frustrating. It is very frustrating because it's not, it's arbitrary. The, the rules aren't written. The, art, the rules are according to which way the wind is blowing that day. And, and then there's the thought that if something goes down, like this, this thing with Georgia, it, it, you know, the advice could be just write it out for three days and uh, just don't react at all if you're a big corporation and it'll go away. And that's kind of true. It's a little, and you can, there can be a little misdirection. Something bigger happens and then people forget about it. I always say, you know, when, listen, when you get into that uh, social media storm and you become the guy under fire, if you're quiet, you don't say anything, it'll go away after about three, four or five days. Yeah. And so, it does. I had, I had something happen to me in Canada in 2017, <clears throat> something that they tried to make it seem like I said something. Sure. They really just, they, they reframed what I said it to, to suit their purpose. Yeah. And I was getting calls all day and it was a pain in the ass. And everybody was like, well, why did he say this? And what, what does that mean? And what? And I didn't respond. And after three, four days, I went away. And I was like, really? Oh, you chose not to they respond at all. Feel like shit for those days. So even though you were taken completely out of context and it wasn't what you said and you were getting right. all the accusations, you just chose to ignore it. Yeah, because the minute you start defending it, sure. you're going to get the counters and people are going to come up with other arguments to prove that you said something you didn't say. And you're like, I'm not going to play this game. I, I, I always say this. I'm responsible for what I say. I'm not responsible for what you hear. Wow. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, and there have been a handful of uh, of folks in the media lately in the last few months that you go, why did you come back and make that apology like that? Why? Yeah. You're just playing right into it. Especially comics. Comics should not play that game. Right. Yep. Yep. The minute they do that, they feel like they can get you. Then they're going to be like, we can control these guys. We're good. Well, when I did my NBC special, they said, no, Jose. 
Really? <laughs> of course. Of course you they should did. have said, I thought you were trying to get the Hispanic community. <laughs> yeah. Isn't you know, your that, wife Hispanic? And, and that's true. And and people, you know, the Hispanic folks that come to my show, who's their favorite guy? It's it's Jose Jalapeno yeah. on his teak. Well, there's a reason the Arabs love you because of Ahmed the terrorist. Well, also, don't forget though, the Israeli folks do as well. And it's and 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 the and it, it's so funny, and I've I've said this too many times, meaning too many times I just repeated myself, but when I the last word tour that we did you know on one night i'm in abu dhabi and there's four thousand folks there in the audience and i bring ahmed out and it's like a freaking homecoming you know and oh, I, yeah. I and i was scared to death to, to even be there doing the show because i didn't know did we sell this place out because they want to kill me or because they love me i didn't know which it was and yeah um, all right i'll tell you a quick story so um you know i i i, I use the the hair powder because i got the, the light spot back here right so, I do it. The uh, topics, I use it too. The topics, yeah, topics. So, and I use it mainly back here because you know you turn around the bright lights, you got the big bald spot back there. So you know, right. so I I used it, and uh, um, uh, we got there to the show in Abu Dhabi, which was a thirty minute drive from uh, the hotel. <clears throat> got to the venue and it was you know like 35 minutes before the show and i'm getting everything ready now it's and i always wait to the last second to get dressed to do the you know, get ready always the last you do the same thing yes yeah, okay i don't know why that is but i, I show up to... with my hair not done my hair's like this when i get there and then <laughs> right before i go on i'm like okay yep. let's do it let's go guys <laughs> yep i'm the same way and i and i have i have two things that i check before i go on stage <laughs> i check to make sure there's nothing hanging out of my nose and that my pants are zipped up that's it. Every right. time. Right. Okay. So, by the way, did you ever see the clip where Carson walks out on stage and he's in like he's like a minute into the monologue and he puts his hands in his pants and 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 he's got in his in his fly flies open, he's got white underwear on? Did you ever see that clip? Oh no. That's oh my gosh. You know what... It was genius because and and everybody's laughing and and as anybody, he's confused as what they're laughing at. He didn't know what just happened. He's looking around and then he looks down and he sees it open. He goes, Oh my gosh. And he turns around back to the audience, zips it up. Turns right back around and just keeps going. <laughs> Hilarious. <laughs> it was great. Right. Side so, note. Uh, side mm -hmm. note. If you do, I've been watching because I'm in quarantine. I've been watching Charles Grodin on Carson interviews and they're friggin' hilarious. Anyway, continue back. All right. Uh, that duly noted. I will go look. So, yes. uh, so we're there in Abu Dhabi getting ready to go on. There's 4,000 people in the crowd and, um, <laughs> my manager at the time, Robert Hartman, you know, Robert, right? I know Robert. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, and this had never happened in all the shows that we did in this world tour, huge number of shows. He comes back and he goes, and again, I'm terrified to be there. And, and I, our curtain peaked and all the guys in the dish dash, uh, outfits all in white and the women slightly behind them all in black. It's like, Oh my gosh, what am I doing here? <laughs> and Robert comes back and he goes, uh, we're going to have to hold the show about 10 minutes. And I go, oh, uh, the, the crowd isn't in yet? He goes, no, the dog sni the bomb sniffing dogs haven't finished. I'm like, the bomb sniff? What the hell? Right? <laughs> so it's like, oh my God. So now I'm more terrified. So I'm getting ready. Audrey, my wife, standing there. And I go, I need the hair powder. She goes, uh, you brought the hair powder. I go, I didn't bring any hair powder. She goes, what do you mean you didn't bring hair? And, and this is, I'm taping for a special, right? So I have to oh, look boy. the same. And it's not, you know, it's, it's a little bit everywhere. So it fills in everything. I can't go oh, without the... Because I'll look completely different. It'll be like, he has hair and every... Th this will be a ruined show and a ruined... We won't be able to use Abu Dhabi because I'll look half bald <laughs> in, the, right. in that one shot. Bright lights, thinning hair. What? So I'm like, oh my gosh, what are we going to do? So Audrey says, hang on, I have an idea. And Starbucks has, I can't remember the name of it, but it's the the micro powder uh, instant coffee. I can't remember the name of it. Hilarious. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's yeah. the but it's the micro powder. It's not it's not like ground. It's like powder yeah, yeah, yeah. that goes into your uh, it starts with a T. I can't remember what it's called. She goes, This is brown. I'm like Oh my God, you're a freaking genius. So I take this powder and I, I just like the topics. I put it all over my head, covers up the bald spots, same color, perfect, right? I go out on stage and I, I, I'm about 30 minutes into the act and suddenly I am really into this show. <laughs> 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 because the caffeine has somehow absorbed into my system because I'm hot and sweaty and it's like I am on fire and killing it, right? And then <laughs> and then unbeknownst to me, uh, Stu, who's uh, one of our uh, one of the other uh, producers who was at the production company, 
he turns to my buddy Jeff Rothpan, who writes for me and is a friend. He was on the trip as well. He goes, "I know Jeff very well too." Yeah. yeah. He goes, "Is is Dunham bleeding?" And and Rothpan goes, "What?" He goes, "Is is Dunham bleeding?" Because down my head, I'm pulling a uh, who was it that that did that uh, just recently? Oh, uh, 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 what you call Giuliani? <laughs> oh yeah, Giuliani. So just like Giuliani, I had this thing coming down my head, and in the lights, it looked like I was bleeding. And Rothpan goes, "Ah, no, it's coffee." <laughs> Stu yeah, goes, you know rock band's so deadpan. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And Stu goes, what, what? Never mind. And then Audrey goes, oh, yeah, it's coffee coming off his head. And Stu's like, what the hell are you talking about? So they stop down tape, and Audrey walks out with a towel and goes, your, your head is dripping coffee. I'm like, my what? <laughs> so she has to wipe it off. And then we walk back, and we just kept the show going. So you can't write That's that. That's pretty awesome. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I was going to ask you before you even got to it, I was like... <laughs> Didn't the caffeine get to you? Oh yeah, it was it was awesome. So now I you know sprinkle coffee on my head before every show. I don't then I don't get it's reflux. Got a big show coming up. Yeah, I don't get Go reflux. To Starbucks, honey. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right, culturally canceled. Um, it is uh, okay. So has there been any group? That's the name of your podcast. Has there been any group that really has tried to cancel you and and say that's it? We're not we're not doing it anymore. Uh no, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you, there's never been a group that said uh, Russell Peters. No, he's not our thing. That's it. He's offensive. You, you, you just you, you, you tread that line and you do it well, and nobody cares. I think the thing is, if listen, you know if your intentions are pure, and if if they're if if you have ill intentions, yeah, you're probably going to get caught out. But when your intentions are not that, they, they can't bring you down because they can't bring you down for something you're not doing. Right. Right. Well, so it's unfair. <laughs> Has there been any point, and this is how I, uh, when we invite guests, this is how I sell it. I love talking to people about the high points. We always talk to people about that, their greatest successes, but I also like to talk about the down points. And you've been doing this stand-up since, only since... 80, oh, 89. 89, okay. That's a long time. 32, 32 years. That's great. So has there been a point where you went, I don't know if this is going to work out for me. I really want to do stand-up. There's many points. There was points in the beginning. There was points. There's points now, t still sometimes. I well, not not recently, but in the past year that I was like, maybe I, maybe this is the, you know, maybe I need to, you know, I, you don't, you're always second guessing yourself, and I think that's the beauty of stand up is that you're never a, you're never above failure. You're one show away from being done. You're always one show away from being done. I think that's what keeps us there. I mean, you know, I, you know, I want to tell you something, you know, I had open for me a couple of years ago, um, which I'm sure somebody you watched growing up as much as I did. I had Willie Tyler and Lester open for me a couple of years ago. Oh, that's great. And he's still around. He's still kicking it, right? Yep. 80 years old now, Willie. Wow. And, uh, so the point was that he opened for you. So he's, he was never, he's never been done, right? Yeah. He's a, he's a guy that he opened for the temptations. He was a, a staple on TV in our childhoods. You know I mean? Yeah. Just to, you know, the good thing is, I, I when I meet legendary people, I want to do legendary things with them, and even if it's just to be in their presence, but to have them like say, "Yeah, I'd love to open for you." I'm like, "What?" I had right. Paul Anka come up to me and tell me we should go on tour together. I'm like, "I'm pretty sure we have two different audiences, Paul." <laughs> have, you, have you ever seen the video of him doing jump? No, Van Halen. Oh yeah, he does Van Halen. He does jump, and he's got the he's got the whole band, you know, pick up their trumpets, going jump. <laughs> Like, no. Hilarious. No. Yeah, no. He was like, you know what? We're both Canadian boys. We're both from immigrant families. You know, I'm Lebanese. You're Indian. We should do this. I'm like, what? It doesn't make any okay. sense at all. Well, you know, I opened, for, I opened for Julio Iglesias a number of times. Really? Oh, yeah. It's like the worst possible idea ever. Why? Because what percentage of his audience actually speaks English as their native tongue? And wants to hear a comedian. They're there to hear this sexy, romantic man. And then you come out. Hey, guys. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good impression of me. Thanks, Russell. Nice. So, yeah. That's it, how it, I do it. Yeah. They, they don't want to see a comedian. And much less a comedian with a dummy. It was like. And then. And this was when I was really early in show business. Uh, really early. I, I remember I walked back after the, the fourth sh show. And I walked to my stage. And I go, Julio, I don't understand. What? It seems like there's all the same people in the front row, the same women. He's like, oh, no, don't tell me that. <laughs> because these groupies would follow him everywhere and always yeah, be in the front row. Yeah, it's horrible. 
And now, now we work with Gabriel Iglesias. See how times have changed. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, all right. So the acting versus the stand-up. Is it two? Is it apples and oranges? If you had to pick one, is apples there one you like more? It really? So one just goes I mean, with the I, other. Yeah. I mean, like, I wanted to get into acting. I wanted to be an actor and blah, blah, blah. Then after you've done some acting, you're like, eh, if I get it, I get it. If I don't, I don't. <laughs> and, and you got to go make, and you got to go work these 14-hour days. No, good. I'm, thank you. I'm good. I'll I'll wait. No, I'll go do a couple of live shows. <laughs> oh, work for uh, an hour. I know that's it. People say, okay, you can have this uh, television gig, and I'm like, wait, I'm going to work how long? For what? And uh, how? Yeah. What are the hours? And wait a minute, hold on a second. I can walk on stage and talk for two hours and be done and make the same thing in that that I worked yeah. for three months. No, I don't. Th I don't yeah. think so. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's got to be the trade off isn't there yet. Yeah, it's it's I I have to learn that you dance with who brung you and you really appreciate where you are because the grass is always greener. But like you say, I think that's what keeps people like us going. You're always you don't think you're good enough, or you you think it's going to end any minute if you don't keep going, and so you never are, are able to. Are you ever able to sit back and enjoy this? Did you, like during the pandemic? Um, have you sat back and said, "I'm just going to relax here for a minute"? I um. I did at first for like the first two months. Yep. And then I started getting a little batty because mm -hmm. then I didn't know where the end was. We still don't know where the end is, but it seems to be more in sight now than it was then. And even when it first started, I think I even called it. I said, I, I bet you this thing's not going to end this year. Yep. Uh, but they can't tell you that. So they're going to tell it to you two weeks at a time. Whatever happened to flattening the curve for two weeks, now we're going to go back to normal. That, well, that you, mentioned, happened. you mentioned you just got off the road. So you've been doing gigs? Yeah, I've been doing gigs. Um, shoot, I've been everywhere. Texas, Florida, Georgia. Uh, I was in New Jersey. So what, what, I like doing clubs. I mean, for me, that's like, uh, I liken everything to, to boxing. It's like in boxing, if you want to get, so you've got a big fight coming up. Yeah. You're not just going to show up at the big fight. you got to go to the gym and get stinky and work and, yeah. and spar with guys and get your ass beat and figure it out. And then when you get to the title shot, you're ready. Right. No, so I, I, I consider... I, I, I get the big stages, the world title defense matches, and then the clubs or the gym, and that's kind of the necessary part of it all. Right, and and so, uh, but uh, like if you're in Texas, how big did they cut it down? Are you like half houses or what are they? Well, when I was in Texas, was in uh, uh, December was the last time I was there, so it was a uh, fifty percent at that point. But I think it's now a hundred percent. So. I wouldn't mind going back to Texas anytime soon. Sure. And Florida, you would never know that it was uh, a lower capacity. Um, Florida was insane. I did Naples, and they were socially distancing six inches apart. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. <laughs> well, yeah. We're, so let me ask you this. I, I saw this in the notes, and I really, I really wanted to ask you this because he's, I've just been such a fan for forever. So working with uh, Shatner in your Indie Detective series, uh, I mean – is is that guy is what you see what you get i i've just imagined that he is that he here's what my take on on shatner and, and see if i'm accurate he has a huge ego uh but he also has a great sense of humor about it he can take a joke but don't piss him off am i close well you gotta also understand he's 90 years old now wow so when i worked with him he was 87 right 80 86 87 I think it was 86 at the time. He actually turned 86 while we were shooting. Yeah. And um, I was so in awe. <laughs> so the first scene we're doing together, I'm so in awe to see William Shatner standing in front of me and talking that we're doing this scene and he walks in and he's like, blah, 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 blah. And I'm like this. <laughs> <laughs> and, and he's and he's like, uh I think you have a line. I go, oh my God, I'm so sorry. I was watching you. That's like, like, I can't believe I'm working with TJ Hooker. Uh, so oh, cool. no, no, you didn't say that. <laughs> oh my God. I did tell him that he laughed. Okay. Oh, and that's. Canadian too, so we bonded on that as well. Right. Speaking of bonding, by the way, the jujitsu thing, who knows about you? Your other interests are, are, are hip hop, martial arts, and, and, and boxing. So the jujitsu thing. And, and when did you start that? As a kid? No, I started jujitsu uh, about five and a half years ago. Oh, because my dad, uh, he was, real, was the he had the longest running, uh, oldest real estate appraisal business in Dallas ever. But 
he didn't mm -hmm. he took that over from his father my grandfather but my dad when he was just out of college i think he went to ucla for a little while as well he was at smu in dallas and then ucla out here uh but when he came out here he tried to make it in show business and he uh had learned jujitsu back in dallas and he came out here and he was a stuntman and so i didn't know what jujitsu was but he was a stuntman for a little while his Greatest claim to fame was he was in a movie with Gene Kelly and Judy Garland called The Pirate. And wow. uh, yeah, he and Gene Kelly got in a fight. So there you go. <laughs> in real life or in the movie? No, no, in the movie. Uh, but oh. uh, speaking of real life, uh, you know, he had to teach Gene Kelly a lot of the moves and the throws. And uh, right. apparently Gene Kelly did it wrong once and my dad uh, kneed him in the crotch and he was out. Gene Kelly was out for a while. So hilarious. Yeah, no, there's a lot of there's a lot of stunt guys that train at my gym. Uh, a lot, about three or four stunt guys that train at my gym. And every time I'm on a set or something, and they'll be like, they'll see me with a jujitsu sweater or a hat on. They'll be like, you train? And I go, yeah. I go, yeah, me too. I'm a, I'm a black belt under blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, oh, well, I'm, a, I'm about to be a purple belt. You know, so we got all these. We, it's, a, it's like this nerdy little jujitsu world. And, and is that your is that your main uh, hobby, other interest thing going on besides that? Or the boxing, the, the hip-hop, I mean, it's really cool. That, that's the thing that uh, keeps me keeps my brain sharp and my body sharp. Hip hop is just something I grew up with. I mean, it's, you know, I was around hip hop from the beginning of it. Like, uh, well, not the beginning. I, I came in about when hip hop must have been about nine years old. And then I, I fell in love with it. And then, and I don't love where, where it's at now, but for me, it's DJing. I've been DJing since 1985. So when they put hip hop, I think they kind of just miss, they just kind of lump it all together. But I'm like, when it comes to DJing, it's not just, I don't just play hip hop. I actually very rarely play hip hop when I'm DJing. I'm nine times out of 10 play classic rock and mix up all these old songs from the seventies just to see what I could do with them. Well, you know, it, when, when I was a, a kid in junior high, when, you know, when the weekends would come along, junior high and high school, when the weekends would come along and there was no dummy shows, no gigs, uh, I had my own little DJ. So that's something else we have in common, Russell. I, 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 had, I had my own little DJ business with my buddy named Glenn Gaines. And this was the name that I gave. And I did, it, junior high, I was like, what, 15 years old when I named it. But we, we had business cards printed up. And it was actually a, a baby blue card, kind of mystical looking. And we were called Crystal Freedom. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I had no idea how hip that actually was at the time. Crystal so, free. You Crystal know what's funny freedom. is the names that we thought of back then. Like my <laughs> brother's friend opened up a nightclub in the 80s. Yep. Like must have been on 86. Right. And it was called Urban Music Assault. <laughs> It's like, this is the dumbest name I've ever heard. Yeah. All right. All right. Last question. I'll let you go. Um, uh, we talked about some of the, a little bit of the down, but if you had to pinpoint, and I hated when people would ask me this question, but I, I, I knew the answer. If you had to pinpoint the point in your uh, career or your life that if that hadn't happened, you, you don't know if you'd be here today. Is, is there a, a fork in the road right there or one of those alternate universes going on where you are not who you are right now? I, I think if if I had not done this special that I did in 2003, I wouldn't be where I am today. And and I'm sorry, tell me which special that is. So I, I, it was my third special. Right. Um, my first was 95, then 97, then 2003. So I had a six-year gap where I didn't do any specials. Right. And they so were, and they were where? Worked. They were where? Where did they air? In Canada, in Canada. And what was the, what was the, was the network or what was it? They were network ones. Like, so the first one was on the CBC. It was called Comics. Oh. And there was like a series they did on, uh, on comedians that would get a 20 minute, uh, 30 minute special on TV. Got it. And I got the first one in 95 and then that did really well. And I got another one in 97, but that was too soon. Right. It was way too soon. And you got to figure 95, I'd been doing it six years, 97, I'm eight years in, um, writing, at a faster pace at that time just wasn't a thing right i was a road comic i just kind of looked at it as well you get this and then you continue back on the road like it didn't mean anything right it didn't equal more money it equaled like oh well now you've got a credit right you know <clears throat> so 97 they gave me another special on a different network because they saw the success of the other one yeah and i fell short on that one a little bit right and and then that then that same company kept doing specials and then it wasn't Till six years later, where I got another special. But in that six years, I had six years to really, really shine up a set, make it really bulletproof. Right. 
And I did that special in August of 2003. When I did it, I was broke as a joke. When I tell you, Jeff, when I tell you broke, I mean broke. They paid me $7,500 for that special. And I was like, yes, I'll take it. Is that what you said? 06? Is that what you said? 03. 03, yeah. And so that one. uh, When I got the check, I signed it and paid bills. I didn't even get any money, any, any money from it. And why? And so that special because you prepared so well for it. You you knew the material backwards and forwards. You, you killed with it. Mm-hmm. And it, and was it material that spoke to the time to the audience? Was it evergreen? I don't know. I don't know what really clicked about it. But somebody it aired in in two thousand and four. Right. And somebody had recorded it and chopped it up. And it started getting sent out as emails to people like, hey, check out this guy talking about Italians. Hey, check out this guy talking about Chinese people. Check out this guy talking about Indian people. Check out this guy talking about Jamaican people. And so back then you would get the file sent to you and you'd have to download it. It took you about 25 to 30 minutes to download a, a four-minute clip. So this was slightly, and, pre, slightly pre-YouTube. Right. So YouTube started in June of 05. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and once YouTube started, then somebody put the whole thing and then – that the whole world changed for me then. And that's it. Yeah, that was just kind of the same with, with me as well. It's when, you know, I came out with my first special, which I kind of pulled back on. I was conservative with it. I didn't want to offend all my conservative friends. Conservative meaning no curse words. It was, you know, clean and all that. Then the second one, I went, ah, I got to do something a little more edgy. Then I came out with Ahmed the Dead Terrorist, and that's when YouTube got big, and this was uh, 07, and mm-hmm. it just went off the... Yeah, Boom. And that's, you know, if that hadn't happened to me, then I we wouldn't be sitting here talking. So, yeah. Oh, yeah. well, man, I, I congratulate you on all your success and all that you're continuing to do. And, uh, uh, oh, yeah, last thing. Um, I, I, you were named one of Rolling Stone's 50 best stand-up comics of all time, setting records right. in arenas around the world. And that's the thing. You, you're not just here, not just North America, not just Canada. You, you're all over the world. The country's everywhere. And uh, I think people should, if they haven't checked you out enough, they need to check out some more. Uh, your Netflix clips, you got stuff on YouTube, you have your own podcast now, and uh, Culturally Canceled. Is it on Apple? Of course it is, Spotify. It's on Apple. It's on iHeartRadio. It's wherever you get your uh, podcast from. It's Perfect. available there. That's great. Well, I wish you great success with that. And I'm I'm not kidding when I say I, if you want to go to India, you, me, and Fluffy, we got to split the money three ways. Oh my God. We, we <laughs> I, I told it. I told Gabe we should do a show together, but now you, you had the three of us. I mean, that would make news all over the planet. Oh yeah, a, a white guy, an Indian, and a Mexican go to India. I mean, it'd be amazing. <laughs> <laughs> and a dead terrorist. <laughs> yeah, and a dead terrorist. <laughs> awesome. All right. So, uh, again, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Russell Peters, thanks, buddy, and I, I hope to see you uh, on another one real soon. Thanks, Jeff, and say hi to the wife and the kids for me. I'll do it. All right. All right, we're back, and we're back with Peanut. Peanut, yes, uh, I enjoyed Russell Peters, and it's good to see you, Jeff, and uh, Mr. McNeil. Matt, how are you both? All good? Hey, good. Doing okay. Well. Oh, thank you. Okay, so Peanut, uh, we're going to introduce a clip. Yes, uh, this is a clip that uh, I would say is uh, fairly famous of mine. Don't you think, Matt? It is famous, correct? I'd say it's probably one of your most famous clips. Okay, good. And uh, Peanut, why did you choose this? I chose this clip because Mr. Russell Peters tends to have too many consonants in his name. He's using unneeded consonants uh, like another guy we know, Jeff Fafa. But now it's Russasa Ilalol. Right? Russasa Ilalol. Yes, that's it. So thank you. That's, that's why I'm here. Russasa Ilalol and Jeff Fafa. Okay, yeah. oh my. thanks for the intro. Okay, all right, here comes the clip. It's it's comedy genius. <laughs> Why did you interrupt me? You mispronounced my name. What, you mispronounced my last name? I know. <laughs> it's Dunham. Now, when you look at it, it says Dunham, just Dunham. <laughs> Ham. <laughs> You're the other white meat. Don't confuse everyone, it's Dunham. It says Dunham, hum, hum, hum. Just Dunham. Dot com. Just Dunham. Dot com. And, and you know, 
you know, when you think about it for a second, it's actually just for four on her. Dot com. What? Just for four? For four? You're using an unneeded F. Just for four. Don't hurt. Dot com. Am I pissing you off for four? All right, Pina, that was pretty good. It wasn't pretty good. It was fantastic. There's no doubt about it. I am the comedic genius, I guess. Okay, great. Yeah. Thanks for joining us, everybody. Be sure and tune in next week for our next podcast, where Apple Podcasts, Spotify, your favorite podcast provider, whatever you want. Right. Yeah. You can also watch us on YouTube. Oh, good. Or on Facebook. Subscribe, like, comment, hit the notifications. Isn't there a bell or something? There is. Okay. Do that. It'll be great. Fantastic. Thanks for joining us, everybody. See ya and hear ya next time.